one of the unique aspects of being human is emotion. Bless you. That we have feelings. And we learn very, very early on that those, that those feelings can be very painful. My granddaughter, you know, was three and a half. And I watch her grappling with the enormity of what she feels. Love, fear, confusion, happiness, sadness, the whole array of uh, what what goes on in our lives. And I have a feeling that our spiritual lives are in many ways an exploration of feeling. And it may be one of the true keys to being alive. And yet I really do sense in almost all of us a desire in many ways to contain them, to avoid them, to minimize them. It's a little bit like wanting to always live at 76 degrees. And, you know, 85 starts to get too much, 56 is a little too cold, and we start to avoid lives that move into extremity. And yet, now that I'm getting old, I'm realizing that extremity is something we're all aiming at. And that the ability to control the emotional schematic is increasingly difficult and also perhaps not desirable. So many people drink away, smoke away, do drugs away of their feelings or just cut them off. So. They can really just go, I don't want to go there, I don't have to go there, I'm not going to go there. And so a huge spectrum of the human experience is literally just shoved into kind of air-conditioned, heated space that feels, this is my 76 degrees of where I'm going to live. And there's so much more going on. There's so much more to life than what you're allowing. And then every so often, something comes and completely disrupts the comfort zone. And there can be a million different things, you know, loss of a job, uh, loss of a loved one, a, re a relationship, um, or getting something that you always wanted, you know. Suddenly great fame or success or whatever, extremities of feeling start to emerge. And, you know, nowadays, <laughs> if you lose a loved one, doctors will give you sedatives, so you don't have to feel that. And, you know, guys come back from the war with PTSD syndrome, and in a way I think we're all suffering from that on some level. You know, we're all traumatized in some ways by our lives. There's a lot that goes on here. And one of the things that has become very clear to me in the last months, I don't know why, but from all the people I'm talking to, is how much childhood and 
the failure of certain things to manifest in childhood, like love of a parent or love of, of classmates, whatever. There's something that tends to go on often for people in childhood that shuts down the door or creates a kind of sense of absence or pain that just doesn't go away. And so many people that I'm talking to are still so angry about childhood experience. Their mother didn't love them, their father didn't pay attention to them. What, what, you know, there's so many issues that go on and they create a sense of kind of despair and longing and insufficiency and uh, sadness, and unhappiness. And, I mean, it goes on and on. And I kind of look at them and go, get over it. Get over it. This is 40 years ago, 50 years ago, whatever, whatever it was. But people are so held back by this emotional weight. And, you know, I do understand how painful it gets. I mean, I'm, I'm part of the spectrum. You know, I do definitely experience what everyone experiences. And I have to say the big difference for me in the last four years or so is that I no longer look at my emotions as mine. I no longer think of them as this is Bruce's problem. They really come at me as a kind of what I would call universal. It's like that emotion is now passing through, taking hold if you will. That emotion is now present, it is arising. Mm -hmm. And what happens when you make it yours which we all tend to do, is that it makes you uh, obsessively involved with it. It's like you can't see that it's a temporary phenomenon. You can't see that it's something rising up like a cloudy sky that's going to turn into a beautiful morning. You just don't get that impression because when it's yours, there's a kind of grasping and a kind of why me and what have I done and it begins to relate back to old tensions and old fears and old emotions, so you build it into something really weighty. And then it takes hold for you for a very long time, or it can. And the f pain of that, really, is uh, the instinct to run away, the instinct to not embrace, the instinct to avoid. and. All I can tell you is the key in all of what I'm saying is accept it, open to it, embrace it, allow it to be. Don't run from what you're feeling because running from what you're feeling is the problem. Entering what you're feeling is the path and the journey that will liberate you. It's only by going toward rather than away that you find yourself. I've talked in the past about meeting a guy on an airplane whose son had drowned in a hot tub in his backyard when his uh, father-in-law was supposed to be watching him and was, but looked away for a minute. I've just been brought into another person who's lost a child. Any of you who are watching the news right now, you know, and you know, I don't totally recommend it, but if, if you're watching the news, the sorrow of what's going on in our world body, if you will, is so enormous. And if you're really open to feeling, you can't help but look at, in my case, because what, what happens when you are a grandfather is that every child on the planet is yours. And I looked at the wreckage of that plane in uh, Ukraine and saw all these coloring books and crayons and clearly somebody was just coloring as the plane was flying and then boom, gone. And the pain of my, of feeling that was so extraordinary. You know, and same thing in, in Palestine and Israel. I mean, there's so much world suffering going on. And, and yes, we can look away. The amazing thing about the news is that if you watch something other than CNN or Fox, you know, you get news in these little tiny chunks 
and then there's a commercial, and then there's something else, and something else, and something else. So you can go, oh, thank God I'm done with the Ukraine. <laughs> thank God Palestine's over. You know, I can go into the weather, the weather patterns, and then that's over. And then they're going to give you, this NBC News gives you a happy story at the end. So the opportunity to truly engage any of this is not, is not there because it just passes through and is over. But there's something about taking it on. And I talk about this father who lost his son and another father who lost his son. Because they couldn't turn away. They couldn't get away from what they suffered. They had to go through it. And in both instances, I have witnessed a breakthrough, if you will, into universal consciousness, where it was no longer theirs, it was everyone's. That they were part of this vastness of being that contains unbelievably intense emotion. And that through that emotion, they had come to find something that I would describe on some level as awakening. <clears throat> they had to go through it to get there. It's not something you wish on anybody, and yet I believe we're all on that path. Whether it's through some tragic occurrence of your own, or some tragic occurrence of somebody else's, whether it is ultimately just the loss of your own personal life, which will absolutely occur. There is a kind of suffering, whether it's the pain of leaving this world, physical, emotional, or otherwise, we're all on this journey. And we will keep trying to turn away from that pain and that inevitability and what I would call reality, because one thing about pain and emotion, it brings you into reality. It's right there. And the thing that's so extraordinary about that reality is that you are present. You cannot be un not present unless you drug yourself away from it. And that being present, even though it is painful and even though it seems to hurt, suddenly goes, <sighs> and you realize that pain has driven you to, allowed you to go toward, allowed you to enter into something amazing. It allows you to enter into yourself. It allows you to discover who you truly are. And that discovery, that discovery is so wondrous, so filled with truth, that you no longer look at that pain as anything but a gift. But there's no way to know that until you're there. And there's no way to get there other than facing what's in front of you. You don't have to take on pain that isn't there, that's crazy. But whatever arises in your life, whatever arises, is real. This is the stuff that's coming up. And if stuff comes up that your mind says no to or doesn't want, look at, look at it. Look at the stuff that's coming up because there's a reason that stuff arises within you and in front of you. If it's there, it's there. I always say if it's in front of you, it's yours. Don't turn away. Don't do something to tamp it back down. Be alive in your experience. Be alive in your feelings. Be alive in what comes to you. And if it is really difficult and really scary and really painful or anxiety producing or whatever it is, do your best to allow it to be. I know we have thousands of drugs that will allow you to damp it down, to turn down the temperature or turn up the air conditioning. I know we have all that. And I know it's probably good for many people whose muscular interior won't allow them to say yes to this stuff. But if you have a capacity inside to say yes to these forces, to say, thy will be done, they are leading you somewhere. And I think they're leading you to truth. And they're leading you to an awareness of being 
that is so much bigger than your own limited personal experience. It is the universal awareness of life and the wonder of what this is and the realization that it's a wild and crazy and, and painful and difficult and, and, and violent exi existence that we're in, all of us. You know, the universe is, you know, it's born out of cataclysm, and so are we on some level, and yet here we are. And it seems to have manifested all of this extraordinary energetic force to make us. And we are one with that force, whatever that means. You know, we can try to gentle it away, we can try to, you know, turn it into fairy tales, we can try to do all of these things to make it bearable, but it's kind of not bearable. It's really big, and it's really intense, and it's really powerful, and it is ultimately real and true. And once you touch real and true, and what Byron called beauty, something changes in you. You just go, yes, yes. You understand it. You stop being angry at the violence. You stop being angry at God. You stop being angry at anything that you are judging to be right or wrong. You just go, this is what it is. And this is what it is. You know, I mean, the universe is, is exactly as it somehow needs to be. And there are longings in us for peace, and there are longings in us for love. And trust me, those are built into the equation. The desire to feel love and to be at peace and to embrace the world are some things that have come out of the profundity of violent exchange. The eruption of life, which is not a simple, easy thing, has come as at, along with love. Love has arisen in the midst of all this. How did that happen? How did beauty arise in the midst of all of this? I, I have zero idea. But I know it has. How did light come out of darkness? Who knows? But it has. And here we are, witnesses to that light, that truth, that reality. And when we sit here in silence, and we sit still, and we ask for help to surrender, we're asking for the muscular capacity to let it be, and not fight and resist and intellectually do battle or emotionally do battle with what's coming. We, try, we are trying to say yes to the enormity of what is. And at some point where you are broken down into nothing, which is what will happen if you keep doing that, you're just broken down and broken down and broken down, and then the universe is going to go, and they will blow you away, literally. Blow you away, and there will be nothing left but this. And there won't be any processing mechanism going, I like this, I don't like that, I wish I could have this, I wish I didn't have that. That just won't function. Or if it does function, it'll be at a very low level because the candle gets exposed to the sun. The light that we are becomes one with all the light there is. And that's who you are. And how are you going to know that? How are you going to find that? How do you get to that place? Well, you don't get there by... Uh, winning an Oscar. You don't get there by being a good daddy. You get there by living in the extremity of human experience, of touching the stuff that arises for you. And whatever that may be, it's yours. And don't run from your feelings. Don't run from what you're afraid of. Don't run toward protection and safety because it's temporary. It's not real. The thing that you're running from will come after you again and again and again. So turn around and go, I'm here. I'm here. It's hard. I mean, this is hard. People who do spiritual work are looking for a safe zone, you know, a place of continual 76 degrees. That's what spiritual seeking is. Give me 76 degrees. You know, I just, just want to be able to dial that in and live there forever. Good luck. You know, it doesn't happen. It cannot happen. And so if you're looking for something to free you from the vagaries of fate, it's not going to happen in this room or in this practice. But what will happen 
is that you can learn to say yes to what most people say no to and to truly appreciate why people say no and to love them and have empathy for their choice and to know how hard it is to live a spiritual life. To really go after this and say, bring it on life because I'm, I'm here to digest it and grow from it. I'm here to eat the, the kernels, the hard grains of life. Because Rudy talked about that all the time. He talked about, you know, it's not about a pablum existence. This is not about pre-digested food. You got to eat it. And the, the bigger the, and the dynamic of your, of your digestive system, the more you can grow. So we're all here to do that. And all I can tell you is it's worth it. It's worth it. Because the alternative is a life living, hiding from, running from, in avoidance of what is real. And that may feel okay for a time being, but it catches up with you. And I've had the benefit of living, you know, a fairly long life. I mean, you know, 71, I, you know, and Rudy said to me day one, he said, this practice is there, for, you need to do this for the rest of your life. Well, you know, I've had 50 years of sitting, 50 years of doing this work. And, you know, the benefit of it is... <laughs> One, it gave me a way to deal with the day-to-day -day of my life all for 50 years. And trust me, a Hollywood career is, is a um, challenging experience. But so is every career, but that one happens to be very public. And, uh, and you know, it's taught me how to raise children and how to support a relationship, you know, for, to have a wife for 45 years and how to live in connectivity with another human being and love each other through all of that ups and all the up and down of... Uh, human experience, my spiritual life has been the grounding and the, and the anchor and the, the, the compass of my life. And so I couldn't have done this without it. But the great joy of a spiritual life is you arrive at a place where you finally know you can't do anything about changing life. But you can do this thing of surrender and just open to it as it is. And it is, especially when awakening occurs, you go, oh, there has never been a time ever where I have not been other than one with the absolute, the totality of being, never. And I've also come to know, of course, that every one of you is one with the absolute and the totality. There's nobody who's not. And the only difference between us is you don't know that yet or you don't want to buy it yet. You know, you don't want to let go of you. And I get it. I know why you don't want to let go of you. You're so invested in you. You've been invested in you for a long time, you know, and your goals and your desires and your dramas and your needs, that it plays out. It's so vital and vibrant in our lives. We live for that. But the truth mm -hmm. is, when you let go of that, you arrive at where you actually always wanted to get, which is free of you free of all your stuff, all your bullshit. And you get to be not free of emotion and free of all the stuff of life. You get to be one with it. You get to be part of what is universal. And you will walk around in a state of extraordinary joy and, re and really a state of real suffering all the time. Because you are the yin and yang of existence. You are that which embraces joy and you are that which experiences loss and tragedy. That's who you are. We all are that. Nobody escapes that. And the oneness of that is an awesome awareness. Awesome. We are the violence. We are what's happening in Ukraine. We are what's happening in Palestine. We're also what's happening in the farthest galaxy we can imagine. We're also what's happening in the middle of our heart. We are somehow the embodiment of, of, of the universe. And it's an extraordinary state to know. And the only way you get there is let go of being separate from that. Stop fighting it. Stop thinking you're this um, you know, unique suffering individual. You are perhaps a suffering individual, but you're not unique in that. You're unique only in your particular corner of your suffering, 
let go of that and be one with all there is out there and realize there's a strange, fierce beauty in it. And that's really what you are. You know, you're not even a body, honestly. You're something so other and so indescribable and so unmentionable and so wildly real. And and you are that right this second, whether you are walking around with that clarity or not, you are that. And all I can do is sit here and kind of tap on your head a little bit and also go a little bit inside some of the resistance in, in you, the, the tensions that are in your molecules, if you will, and just break them apart and help you feel and see that this is true. You, you won't arrive anywhere other than where you want to be, or in truth, you won't arrive anywhere other than where you are. And trust me, it's where you want to be. It's so brilliantly alive and wise and intelligent and caring and loving and supportive and encouraging. And, and, and trust me, it wants everything you do. It wants you to have great sex. It wants you to have a great job. It wants you to have all of these things that you want. But it also knows it's only for a time. And in the end, it all retreats into the perfection of itself. And you are part of that perfection. You are absolutely part of that perfection. Your wants and wishes and needs and dreams are part of that perfection. Your imperfection is part of the perfection. It's who you are. You are one with all that is. So. I'll, I'll tell you briefly, I, I, I had a, I mean, my life is in a state of unbelievable, I kind of, upheaval is the wrong word because I'm not experiencing that way. But, you know, we're moving from a home we barely unpacked into another home in another, in another back in upstate California in, in San Rafael. So we're repacking up a whole house and going through all this again six months after having just done it. Um, I had a series of job interviews, or pitches they're called, this last week that were um, life-defining on some level. You know, the changes that came from them would be re remarkable if I, they're for two television shows that were they to go forward would make unbelievable demand. If they failed, it would be the end of an era, you know, if they didn't go forward. And uh, there was just enormous weight all coming in, 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 in coming right to, into the uh, focal point this week, and, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, I don't know the outcome of either of these two pitches. I don't, my gut level tells me my, the era is over. <laughs> I've had my run, and, uh, and there's a part of me that's sad, and there's a part of me that's satisfied by that. Um, I, I could not have done better in the, in the room, you know, but I, I have to say I was a nervous wreck <coughs> going, going into these meetings, and I'm going, why, after all of this, what I would call awakening, would there be any kind of tension, fear, uh, anxiety? Why? Why? I, I just, I kept, and I couldn't get rid of it. It just kept rising up in the middle of the night. It would rise up. I mean, I didn't know how to explain it to myself. And, and, and I felt, well, then this must mean that this awakening thing wasn't real because I shouldn't have all these kinds of dramatic feelings. But I'll tell you, they were extraordinary and, and meaningful to me. And, and neither, none of these feelings entered into the room with me. They all went away before I got in the room. They just led up to the meeting. They, didn't, they weren't part of the meeting. The meetings were all absolutely still-pointed, energy-full, rising eloquence in a way. You know, the, the, everything, said what had to, everything got said that had to be said in exactly the way it needed to be. So, Bruce felt acquitted, in a way, of all of that. The thing I knew is that Bruce couldn't do any of these meetings. I have this problem now. It's a little bit like, it's, it's a memory failure, but it, and it probably goes with old age, but it probably goes with awakening, but I don't remember things from about two seconds ago. I can, but it's hard. And so, you know, if somebody says, you know, 
go get this at the supermarket. It's gone the minute I'm told to get it. And, and it's a little bit like when you have a dream and you suddenly go to the next scene, there's no way to remember what just happened. As huge as it may have been, it's just gone. Well, that's what it feels like for me. And I could not hold on to these pitches. I tried to hold on to what I had to say. I would read it over and over. I kept trying to memorize it. And I know I'm no good with memory. And so I had to trust that something would arise in that moment that would be what was needed. And I couldn't bring it into the room. I just had to show up and it had to happen. And of course, I've trusted over the course of years that it would because it always seems to come. But it's a lot of trust in the universal to arise when it needs to. And if it doesn't arise, the experience is, the few times I've had it, standing there with your pants down. That nothing is supporting you. You're just there and your ego mind doesn't know what to say or do. And in my case, there's no memory. I couldn't tell you the story of my show if, you, if I tried. On the other hand, when I let go, which is what I, the car ride to the studio was just be quiet. I didn't think about anything. I just stayed quieter. I felt joy and I felt happiness. And that was all there was. Some guy was pitching a show sitting next to me in the waiting room and we started talking. I went, I don't know why he's here and why we're talking, but it was so sweet. And, and we just had this sharing and then the meeting happened and the meeting was absolutely impeccable. Uh, again, I don't think these shows are going to happen for, for various reasons, and I don't I want to go into all that, but I walked away from the meetings, and I went, huh. And I felt this whole shift, everything. I felt like all these years of my life were suddenly finished. I, I was walking out of, it was at Sony, and, and uh, <laughs> as I'm walking out through past the cafeteria and the outdoor eating area, people are bringing out a picture of, a cardboard picture of Queen Latifah. <laughs> and, you know, I gave her her first job in Hollywood. She was in a movie that I, that I directed. And there's this cardboard picture of Queen Latifah, and there's me walking out, thinking for the last time, and I'm walking away from Queen Latifah had finally become a cardboard figure that people wanted to pose with, mm. and, my, and I'm walking out of, away from all of this, and I'm going, okay, okay. It felt exactly right in its own stupid way, you know? And I got in my car and I drove home, and I just felt, wow, life has changed. And it's a big change. It's not going to be what it was before. Everything that defined me is probably going. Now look, it could come back tomorrow. But I'm telling you, the reality in my mind is it's gone. And it's a powerful feeling of transformation. The feelings inside are so strong and in a way beautiful and painful at the same time. And I did not want to turn away from them from, for an instant. And what I felt... And what I feel even as I speak is another layer of freedom, another layer of liberation coming from all of this. And I know all of you, you know, those of you who work in the business, those of you who have other careers or things where there is a meeting that's going to change everything, we become human beings who care. You know, I try to think, did Christ on the way to the cross not get nervous? <laughs> you know, you know. I just, I mean, and and I was thinking about Moses. I don't mean to be grandiose here, but I was thinking about Moses going into the Pharaoh. What a thing to do, walking into the Pharaoh and say, "Let my people go." You know, he doesn't know what's going to happen with Pharaoh. Might as well just have killed him on the spot. You know, but the chutzpah it takes to show up in your own life to be walk into these rooms and not know the outcome and be willing to accept whatever happens and just go it's the way it should be and not to walk into it feeling I'm a dead man if it doesn't work out because you're not a dead man you're just somebody without that thing whatever that thing might have been you'll be whatever the thing that is and that's going to be fine trust me I mean it will be fine uh, I'm sorry I'm gonna ramble like mad here but I just saw this article I think it was on CNN webpage, but this woman took pictures of all of her friends who are in their 20s, and none of them had jobs. They were all living at home. They were all finding their way. They were looking for work. And I suddenly said, my God, we're in a whole new generation here. The expectations of having something are not available for most people. They can't go out and just get a job. There's hardly anything out there. And, and I'm looking at things like Airbnb and um, uh, um, Uber, you know, and I'm finding people are finding ways in a world that doesn't offer the opportunities that it used to, to, f to get through, 
to make a life. And the funny thing about these people this woman was documenting, they all looked strangely happy. They looked happy because they were accepting that they're living in a different world from the world I grew up in. And they somehow are discovering that the true joy of life is not in being celebrated. It is not necessarily in being the president of, or CEO of a company or in having a hundred billion dollars, which you know a lot of people seem to be doing these days. But that, that's not where it's at. Where it's at is being now. Where it's at is waking up in the morning and doing whatever you do. It's so extraordinary to live your life and to know that you're human and that your life is going to be challenging and that there's going to be good days and bad days and good feelings and bad feelings. Whatever it is, it's what you've got. Use it. It's your nourishment. It's your, it's, it's your connection to the universe. And your connection to the universe is emotional. It's not just intellectual. That solves a few problems. It's emotional. You are an emotional being who feels things that are often horrible and often wonderful. More often not so great. Often kind of middle ground. The great stuff is the stuff you keep aiming at. You know, I want that, I want that, the desire, you know, if you could only have that sex one more time with that situation, it would be perfect. But it doesn't, you can't replete it. It's a new thing. It's something else. The sad feelings, the loss, those are pervasive. It's all part of what we are. Say yes to it. Just say yes to it. I've probably been rambling forever, but I just, I feel... I, I'm so afraid of the spiritual dynamic that tells you in some way that you're going to arrive at peace and joy. Because you're not. And if you do, you're... I don't know what delusion you found yourself in. It's not true. Peace and joy is, is momentary. And it's great. Don't deny it when you get it. But don't hold on to it like it's going to be forever. It will not. Nothing is forever except transition and change and upheaval and the violence of being and you're somehow a still point of absolute beauty at the, in the middle of that. How did it happen? What is it? How did this come about? Who knows? But it is absolutely real and you are one with it in a phenomenally meaningful way. So feel your way into the heart of your suffering and into the heart of your joy and into the heart of your day-to-day -day boredom. Feel your way into all of this stuff and embrace it because it's an amazing thing to be here. It is amazing to have this life. Don't squander it by trying to deaden it and wish it away. Any questions? This is perhaps more of a request for elaboration than a question, but there's a very powerful theme that's emerging me and what you're saying on the one hand, for example, chewing the hard grains of life as opposed to the pre chewed pablum of, of a child. On the one hand, going, <clears throat> going out into the world with all its different weather as opposed to seeking for a sort of womb-like kind of protection that's climate control and everything is taken care of. It, it almost seems like the direction is to move forward actually means to leave that childhood mentality behind and in some ways maybe even the death of some kind of internal childhood child spirit it's not wrong to seek 76 degrees it's not wrong to want that but the air conditioning is going to break down on occasion you know, the heat's not going to work, things are going to change, and you have to learn not to think it's wrong, not to think it's bad, but to go, this is what it is. And f do whatever you do. The, s the striving for comfort is not wrong. It's part of the human experience. But in the middle of all that, you are going to feel all sorts of forces. Things happen to you. You can get sick. You know, people you love will leave you or die. There's going to be all of these undercurrents that are going on, and they don't they're part of being at the 76 degree temperature perhaps, but they're, they're, they're these chilling factors that come through it and you have to look at them and go, you can't deaden that away. You can't try to live in a state where that stuff's not going on. You are in a state where all of this stuff is happening and you have to take what is in front of you. What is? 
that's what's there. And so, looking for perfection, looking, I mean, yes, I understand it's instinctual on some level. My granddaughter is certainly doing it at the age of three. It's part of what we do, but the awakening is to be what is. Be what is, and have the strength to be what is, because it's a lot of stuff. There's a lot going on. I know you feel it. I know you go through a lot of your own inner struggle and drama, just like all the rest of us, but I, I'm privy to some of that, and I know how hard it is. Don't think it's wrong. Don't think you have to get away from that. Just go. And I have watched you do it, in fact, and I've watched how big your heart's getting. I've watched how embracing you are of this totality that you are. It's not an easy totality, but it's yours. And the fact that you are able to open to it is what distinguishes you as a real and a vibrant human being. You're going to have so much to offer the world because you are living in touch with the stuff most people can't face. That's a real challenge and it's a real gift. And you have brought yourself to the table over and over and over. Not easy, but the rewards are enormous, as you will discover, especially as you get older. And you realize, you know, I made it. I lived it. I lived through this unbelievable adventure. And trust me, at the end of life, you know, old guys sit around to talk about their adventures, you know, about what the war was like and what this was like. You want to have some adventures. You want to go through life to have that to sit at the end. And I suppose death is everybody gathering around going, oh my God, you should have seen the life I had. You know, what a, what a ride. Wow. We all have these amazing lives. Or not. You know, some people sit around and do Sudoku. I don't want to be at the end of my life talking about the one time I couldn't figure out a Sudoku puzzle. You know, it doesn't add up for me. But, you, but for, for some people, that's, that's, all they, that's all they have. You know, I think, take it on. Live it. Spiritual life, from Rudy's perspective, is live your life. Live your life. That's your spiritual life. Not go in a cave. Not sit in a meditation hall every day and go, oh, mom, oh, mom, oh, what the hell is that? You know, who wants to live that? That's so boring. And it has nothing to do with anything. Even if you float off into pure bliss, you know, at some point they're still going to take your body away. Then who's going to be sitting in that room? And you have to deal with that. If you haven't dealt with all of those ravages of time and space, you're not going to be prepared for anything that comes. Live the tough life, because it's what you've got, what we've all got. There's no easy ride, period. Unless you think Sudoku is your answer, you know. It's not, I don't think. Does that get to it at all, what you were asking? Sort of. You can check with me later. <laughs> anybody? Anybody else? I think you, you may have answered a, a long time ago. I think it was Rabbi Ben Ezra said, "May all your joys be two parts pain, but the pain is God's love." And I, I never understood it, but I think what you're saying today is it, you, you almost need the pain to recognize the joy. To Absolutely. The joy. Absolutely. They're part and parcel of the whole. You know, it's, it is yin yang. It always has been yin yang. You know, and I think I've said this recently, I've always thought yin-yang were these little balancing factors. They're not there. <laughs> They're big. They're big factors, and we feel them. They're huge. Life is huge. You know, and as Rudy would say, brutal. But, but the ride through it is an amazing adventure. You know, watch Lord of the Rings again, you know, and, you know, Frodo goes through, you know, the monsters and steps falling off into the abyss, and he gets through it somehow. But boy, is it a ride. It's a real adventure. We'll have tales to tell, you know? And those tales at the end of your life are fulfilling. You go, wow, wow, amazing. And it's not over. Probably the biggest adventures are right at the end, you know? And nobody prepares you for those. They don't even talk about them, really. But they're intense. Anyone else? Okay, sorry this is so long to those who have to sit through it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I do appreciate you guys coming, and uh, you know, this class goes on and on here. There's always extraordinary people sitting right here, giving you the same em emptiness and nothingness that hopefully that be is being presented now. And uh, you know, come come and sit in it. It's a good space. Thank you.